We're here at HIMSS 2016 in Las Vegas with John Melling, partner of Pivot Point Consulting. Welcome, John. Thanks, John. Good to be here. So it's great to have you here. You have such an experience in, in technology and how do you improve the business processes. So, so let's start off at about talking about what's your view on the future of revenue cycle management and, and what role does technology play in that? Okay, it's a great question. And I think we've, we've been dealing with some of those changes over the past few years with the introduction of ICD-10 and, sure. and the impact that that has. And then with the Affordable Care Act, the, the move um, from just saying, okay, well, we'll refer a patient and then we'll deal with it. Deal with it. Now we've got to have much more accurate and complete information as part of the referral mm -hmm. and then to, to deal with the eligibility checking and, and prior authorization and medical necessity. So, so that's the kind of background. We're still seeing now with, with CMS wanting to move towards value-based reimbursement. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be caught in this uh, twilight period where we're still de dealing with fee-for-service sure. and now we're going to have to deal with value-based reimbursement. One foot in each pocket, right? Well, yeah, <laughs> and may maybe systems that are incompatible for dealing with both. So, <laughs> so you know, the CMS has put a fairly tight time frame on the, on the move to value-based reimbursement yep. and value-based care. By 2020, they want to have something like 90% of all hospitals sure. billing to value rather than to activity. Mm -hmm. So that, that creates some enormous pressures on the industry, both for the EMR and revenue cycle vendors, but also on the hospitals and the payer organizations to make sure that we very clearly understand what the outcome is that we're trying to move towards. Mm. So being able to understand the clinical protocols and what, what they mean in the care process and being able to manage the risk around it. So I use a very simple example. If you contract for five things, Mm -hmm. and it actually takes you 10 things to, to make the patient better. Uh -huh. You don't get paid for those other five, you get paid for the first five. Sure. So being able to identify that patient early and being able to assign him to a risk-based contract is the only way that you can do this. Mm -hmm. So that, that puts enormous pressure on the entire sequence from first referral all the way through to final bill and managing the claim as well. So, so it's a complex process to do that. and. One of the challenges that we are going to face is that revenues are going to dip as a result of moving to value-based reimbursement. Mm. It doesn't mean to say that you're going to lose money necessarily, it means that you've got to change the way that you look at your patient. And you've got to hold that patient as a member of a fairly stable cohort so that you can estimate the overall cost of treating that, that group of patients rather than the individual patient. And, and moving just from being a curative organization to being a wellness organization as well, and maybe reconfiguring the way that services are provided. So it's not all about the doctor, but it might be an LPN or a, a sure. physician assistant or any, any one of those types of organizations where you've still got the skill, but they're not as expensive as the doctor. And you can allow the doctor to continue to do more of what he's trained to do and paid to do. So th th those are some of the changes. I, I think we'll also see perhaps systems that will piggyback on our existing EMRs to, be, to, to allow organizations mm -hmm. to deal with both fee-for-service and also um, the value-based reimbursement as well. Well, it seems like to me that, you know, when you when you talk about the shift, I mean, payer, the other payers are doing it as well. I mean, Medicare yeah. absolutely is in. Yeah. I've heard other payer organizations, yeah. the same shift in yes, model. Yes, it is. But as you look at that shift, I mean, I've asked the question, is there any way you could do that shift without technology? Like, I mean, it seems like technology is essential. Do you share that view or, or what's your thoughts on that? Technology is essential. You can't you can't do it. And, and you know, it, I think it's, it's almost a non sequitur that, you know, for the past 20 years, doctors have not been able to retain all the information in their head to treat patients <laughs> in the way that they used to do. The advances in medical technology, the advances in the amount and volume of information that we're looking to gather. You know, I, I was talking to people this morning on the floor about their approach to population health. And that, that's associated, you know, the, the whole yeah, analytics aspect. It. It, <laughs> that's going to be some of the driver, particularly around accountable care organizations and the move to bundled payments, episodic billing rather than encounter-based billing. All of those require more information and more complete information. Mm -hmm. So you need technology to be able to support that process and to drive some of the workflow so that you're not creating bills that are almost de facto inaccurate. Wow. And so you know, looking at the back end of that process and saying, well, what do the denials look like and how do we manage those denials so that we can clearly isolate the cause and the effect right. is going to be critical in this as we move forward. That's great. So, I mean, I think most organizations see that, right? And, you know, yeah. I think we've illustrated what this is happening, but what can they do today to really prepare for that? So, um, 
if, if we take the idea that the time frame is five years, and uh, okay. I think that's the same for the commercial providers Seems as well, reasonable. and the yeah, commercial yeah. payers, I actually think it will take longer than that. Mm. Um, so there are they'll start tasting it, I think. St well, got, <laughs> and my belief is they've got to start now. They've got to start working out what their strategy is to move through this period of fee-for-service and value-based care and reimbursement. Mm -hmm. So identifying where the changes are to systems, identifying where the changes are mm -hmm. to data, and identifying where changes are required to workflow um, is going to be critical. And I, I think the additional aspect of that is, and we're seeing this out in the field, it's a very complex area that we're dealing with now in terms of charge capture and reimbursement. <laughs> and getting more complex every it's day. It's getting more complex every day, <laughs> but, but you, you go into some hospitals and the folks in their revenue cycle area, particularly in billing and collections, are not always aware of all the federal mandates and, and, and legal aspects sure. of those changes. So you see organizations that are not billing for things like high value prostheses, for example, but are billing for um, items that, that are not chargeable. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, that creates a problem in terms of how we manage the bill and, and minimize sure. the, the denial. So, you know, th those kind of things, you've got to understand the law, you've got to understand the process and the changes that may be needed. And that may include outsourcing some of those kind of things as well. You can't necessarily always do it the same. And, you know, I, I think we've been dealing with outsourced revenue cycle for quite a while in terms of aspect, you know, whether it's Medicare and Medicaid and we'll, we'll handle, <laughs> you know, the, the commercials. Um, but equally, when you look at, at where we are with um, the impact of the exchanges and the fact that people have choice and want to go where they want to go for care, one of the things that they tend not to understand is that if, you, if you're on a low, low premium, high deductible plan, in effect, you're like a self-pay patient, right? <laughs> That's true. And how you manage that, and you know, if, if you look at some of the, the history, we, we were probably collecting about 80% of the bill value for, for CMS type bills. Right. I think that's gonna drop, um, mm -hmm. because now we've got more self-pay patients, and that's gonna be a huge impact in terms of survivor, survivability, sustainability of some of these organizations because they're going to have to get better at, at collections um, <laughs> and maybe collecting in advance so that they're not waiting until the patient's gone to collect some of those, yep. those fees. They have to. I love how you described it. It's really, you know, you need to have a strategy yeah. and, and, and not just, you know, a technology strategy, yeah. but really an organizational strategy. What yeah. organizations are going to be required in that future? Yeah. And then also the data. What data yeah. is going to be required? Yeah. I would probably add the, you know, what's the quality of that data? Exactly. And then you said workflow, which I think yeah. also hits to the data, yeah. right? If you have the wrong workflow, you're getting the yeah. wrong data. So. And I, I think the other thing, as I said earlier on, being able to contain your, call them members, but they're, they're patients. And, you know, if people are dipping out of your system and going elsewhere to get care, then you're missing out on some of that information that's going to be critical to providing care in the future. So if you're trying to treat, treat the person as a whole person, then you've got you to be able to data. deal with that. And, you know, one, one might suspect that in the next five years, we're going to move forward with genomics and the impact of genomics on the care that we provide, being able to identify markers that will suggest whether you're susceptible to a particular drug yep. or a particular condition. That all factors into revenue cycle. It comes at a cost and it comes Absolutely. in a way that has to be managed. So we're, we're just layering complexity onto what is an already complex environment. And, and so we've got to, if you don't do the strategy piece, you won't be able to identify the areas that are important to you. And I think part of that is obviously how provider organizations, as I say, first of all, treat you as a whole person, but also work with their payer community to understand what their expectations are moving forward, because you can't do this in isolation. Yep. I, don't, I don't think we're going to see this always being done in an accountable care organization, although that seems to be the best structure <laughs> yeah, right yeah. now. Uh -huh. But if we are going to move into a situation where we move to episodic care, bundled payments, I think, are going to take on a much higher profile sure. rather than just fee-for-service and, and other, other forms of reimbursement. Love it. Perfect way to finish. Collaboration. Okay. Thanks so Good. much for your insight. Thanks, John. Good to meet you.